We are remarkably good at acclimating to groundbreaking innovations. When we recount a flight, we don't exclaim over the experience of rocketing through space at 30,000 feet. Instead, we describe the in-flight entertainment. We take it for granted that doctors should wash their hands in between patients. And we can't remember what it was like to live without cell phones, even though we've only been carrying them around for about a decade. Ooh. We acclimate to these things quickly. We take it for granted that things change. And we undergo a kind of societal forgetting when something changes and a new thing takes its place. And tonight, I would like to reawaken all of you to the wonder that was the Ferris wheel. Now, for a modern person, when you think of a Ferris wheel, you probably imagine something like this. But, for people at the time that the wheel was invented, their impression was a little more like this. The Ferris wheel debuted at a World's Fair, the World Columbian Exposition of 1893, and World's Fairs have kind of gone out of style, so let's talk about what these were. The very first World's Fair was in 1851, but one of the very best took place in 1889 when France hosted the Exposition Universelle in Paris, and the world was enchanted. People said it could never be bested. Other countries were encouraged to bring their own expo exhibitions, but France did most of the work, and they justifiably got the lion's share of the credit for this international triumph. And arguably, the standout French contribution to the fair was the Eiffel Tower. Maybe you've heard of it. <laughs> now, if you think that people go apeshit over this thing now, you should have seen how they reacted when it debuted. There were serious pants feelings about this tower. <laughs> when it came out in 1889. And when Eiffel revealed it to the world, America, like everybody else, was like, qu'est-ce que le fuck? <laughs> My dad deserves credit for that joke. <laughs> then when we saw this tower, we realized that in comparison, what we'd brought to the potluck was a half-baked cat turd. <laughs> See, we really dropped the ball on the French exposition. We slapped some shit together like a school kid the day before the science fair. But unlike that school kid, we were called out publicly for it. So the US is both impressed by the fair and embarrassed by our contribution. And like anyone experiencing a confusing mix of strong emotions, we needed an outlet for those feelings. We wanted a second chance to prove that we could bring something other than a dumpster fire to a global exposition. <laughs> so we suggested our own fair. But one question emerges, where should we host this event? Every major American city wants the honor. St. Louis wants to host. New York City is like, well, of course we should do it. Chicago throws their hat into the ring as well. And while it may not be surprising today to imagine Chicago taking on a project of this size, it was very surprising back then, and I'm gonna tell you why. So, 1890 Chicago, honestly the place is a mess. Now I'll admit, there's some stuff going on that's not exclusively Chicago's fault. For instance, we're at the tail end of the Gilded Age. And the Gilded Age is characterized by extreme social unrest. There's massive income inequality, blatant political corruption, and rampant racism. I didn't want to say it, but thank you. Relatable. On a more positive note, there are also sweeping social reforms, but big social changes are really hard for the people experiencing them. So things feel unstable and folks are worried about the future. Yikes. So the Gilded Age thing is not really Chicago's fault, but this next thing kind of is. I'd say it's half Chicago, half your standard late 1800s big city bullshit. After the Great Fire of 1871, Chicago rebuilds at a dizzying rate, and they're feeling pretty fat and sassy about it. They want to claim the title of banging a city in the US. But Chicago's rapid growth means that things are changing faster than people can acclimate to them, and the city develops a bit of a reputation, so we're gonna go ahead and 
take that away. Sorry, Chicago. On average, two people are killed by trains at railroad crossings every day. The air quality is so bad that at times you can't see past a single city block. Garbage and dead animals lie in the streets attracting flies. Now, can you find the same flavor of nastiness in other Western cities at this time? You bet. But it's all just a little bit worse in Chicago because it's changing too fast for people to keep up for it all. There's one other thing I haven't mentioned yet that makes Chicago kind of a weird choice for the fair, and that's the slaughterhouse stuff. And this is pure, unadulterated Chicago. So during the American Civil War, Confederate blockaders forced the North to relocate their meatpacking headquarters, and the famous Union stockyards are formed. And the stockyards smell god-awful. The stench of blood, burnt hair, fecal matter, and putrefaction hang over the place, and the smell doesn't always stay in the stockyards. The stench is revolting, and it features prominently in the mind of anyone who visits the city. <laughs> so I saved the slaughterhouse part for last because this is really the crux of the inferiority complex motivating Chicago to host this fair. They want to shake off that reputation as a bunch of grody pig slaughterers and make a comeback as a bunch of refined pig slaughterers. <laughs> So finally, Congress puts the decision to a vote, and lo and behold, Chicago wins. You can clap. So as you've heard, there's a lot of motivation on Chicago's end to do this fair upright, and they make some ambitious plans, but they know that to really blow this shit up, they're gonna have to one-up Eiffel's Tower. Enter George Washington Gale Ferris. He's young, mustached, handsome, flexible. <laughs> a steel engineer from Pittsburgh. <laughs> now that last thing I listed is important. You see, steel connections come in handy when you're building a giant ass wheel because giant ass wheels need a lot of steel to get built. The wheel's axle is to be the single largest single piece casting ever made. But we're getting ahead of ourselves. Ferris has to submit his idea three times before anyone will let him build the damn thing. Everyone thinks it's going to be too scary for people to want to ride. And worse, if people do ride it, it's going to collapse and squash everyone. But Ferris perseveres, and his idea is finally accepted by the committee, and he starts building. But he comes across a new challenge. See, Chicago has some interesting natural qualities that make it kind of a hard place to build things. First, there's the soil. Above its very deep layer of bedrock, Chicago has this crazy layer of watery clay sand that people compare to quicksand. Not ideal building construction for a tall structure, so that's super fun. Additionally, I don't know if you know this, but Chicago has some fucked up weather. There are rainstorms that flood everything, and crazy winds blow on off the, the lake and wreck shit. And unbelievably cold weather brings construction to a standstill. Everyone nearly misses their construction deadlines because of these setbacks. But the fair just squeaks by on time, and the doors are opened, and people are floored. I mean, they are gobsmacked. They've never seen anything like this before. It's enormous. And it's painted all white, so visually, it's very striking. And the whole thing is lit up by electricity all night long. And electricity is relatively new. Most of the people at this fair have never seen it up close before. There are wonders to see, new things to try. Folks come from all over the country and the world to see this fair. But the real hype generator is Ferris's wheel. People have been hearing about this thing for ages. But the fair opens, and it's not done yet. All they've managed so far is a test run without passengers, and during that test run, bolts and wrenches left behind by the construction crew rain down from the wheel. <laughs> so that's super chill. <laughs> but they get some cars on this thing, and they decide it's time to try the wheel with passengers. So it's late in the evening. Ferris is out of town? 
I don't know, but his wife is present, and like a badass, she insists on taking the first ride. So she and some prominent folks climb aboard one of the cars, and let me tell you, they're scared shitless. <laughs> this wheel is as tall as Chicago's tallest building. The spokes are long and delicate. For months, critics have been saying it'll never withstand the stress of a high wind, let alone the weight of several thousand passengers. And if that's not enough, the safety glass and grills haven't been installed in the viewing windows yet. I mean, you compare this to a modern Ferris wheel, like you have to be working hard to get hurt on one of these things today. These modern things are lawsuit proof. But imagine that instead of these safety precautions we're all used to, you're in a big box 300 feet in the air and some of the sides of the box are missing. But, in spite of all this, Mrs. Ferris and her companions climb into the car, the door is closed behind them, and the wheel begins to move, and the people are lifted into the air. But suddenly it stops. Nearly 100 people, emboldened by the little crew in Mrs. Ferris's car, rush the ride operators and force their way onto the car below. They want a piece of the action, too. And the ride operators are just like, okay, guess we'll let them ride. So the doors close behind this raucous crowd and they're off and the wheel begins to turn and the cars ascend once again. And what these people are feeling, this is a new sensation. We are 10 years out from the first airplane. Hot air balloons have been invented, but the average person hasn't been in one of those. So unless you have the opportunity to go to the top of a skyscraper, and again, most people haven't, you've never been this far off the ground in your entire life. But even that is kind of a false equivalency because you're not in a building encased by glass with a solid wall under your feet. You are moving through the open air like a bird. You're having this incredible new experience, and it's pretty scary. So I imagine these people up in this wheel, and I picture them exclaiming to one another, and the folks in the rowdy car are shouting out jokes. There's a lot of noisy bravado to cover up how scared everybody is. And the cars reach the top of the wheel, and the sun starts to set, reflected on the lake below, and the electric lights of the fair start to come on. This ghostly white city is glowing in the dusk. And all these people in these cars, including the rowdy folks who just pushed their way on, they just stop talking. Fear melts away in the face of this beautiful scene. And that fear is replaced by awe. Everyone goes silent as they're watching the sunset together. And a man in Mrs. Ferris's car describes it as the most beautiful thing he's ever seen or will likely see again. Epiphany. Now, don't you think that having that kind of experience is probably going to change you for the rest of your life? There's a really valuable lesson in all of this. It took courage to get into that car for its first ever passenger ride. And that same emotional journey of fear and excitement, giving way to solemn awe, takes place hundreds of thousands of times over the course of this fair as new waves of passengers try out this wheel. And by far the most popular time of day for a Ferris wheel ride is at dusk. Everyone who climbed aboard the wheel was scared the first time they did it. And I'm sure they would have enjoyed the view even if they hadn't been afraid. But fear wakes you up and it forces you to be present. And I have no doubt that the fear they felt was heightened by the intensity of the experience they shared as they watched the sun set over the fair. It's so important to push through these moments of fear in your life because the payoff makes the discomfort all worth it. So here's to buying your ticket and getting on the ride. Yeah, no, hard pass on getting on that thing first time. <laughs> maybe the second time, maybe the second time. Uh, Muriel, don't go too far away because when you've given your third talk here, <laughs> you officially become one of us.
Uh, she becomes a member of the Order of the Wolpertinger. Muriel, please come forward, along with Lily Gutnick and Casey Selden, please. He, he, he. We now own her soul. Um, <laughs> we have a little dance party going on. Uh, so we are now officially at the intermission, but before you get up and spend just dumb amounts of money at the bar, um, we do have for sale these wonderful adventure Harveys made by our very own Isolde Honore. Where are you? She's over somewhere. A little epiphany, Harvey. These Harveys travel on their very own. They're, they have very tiny wings. Very, very tiny. But they're, they're surprisingly mobile. Uh, they manage to travel all over the world. In fact, you can follow them by looking at Hashtag Adventure Harvey on both the Twitter and the Instagram. That's what they're called, right? <laughs> We're big into maps. Uh, and so you can follow Harvey's adventures all over the world. In recent, uh, in recent trips, he's attended a tea party. He's visited, I believe this is Budapest. And he's also joined the Palio in Siena. He's very sophisticated. So go ahead over to the merch table where you can get your very own adventure, Harvey, and take pictures with him in your travels as well. Or, you know, just let him go off. Speaking of the merch table, it's right there. What? Harvey, oh. There we go. It, it's more, yeah, exactly. Harvey's having a good night. Uh, so Harvey is available for your purchase over here at the merch table, along with a bunch of other amazing things. We have glasses, we have all sorts of other stuff. This is a community project. We need your support. Please be generous. It's very, very kind to all of us and keeps this thing going, which means a lot to those of us who have our own fancy little pins like Muriel just got. Uh, so here he is, here is your adventure, Harvey, with the epiphany light. Uh, we will have three more stories after the intermission, much more science-themed in the second half. We will have stories of parachuting into places that you really shouldn't. We should have coming up with an idea for a test that doesn't really make a whole lot of sense, and we will have an idea so ludicrous that it could only be proven by standing on top of a building and basically threatening to throw someone off. So please go enjoy your cocktails, go enjoy the merch table, and we'll see you back in about 15 minutes.